We were about to write the leaders of the European Union last year on this issue of reparatory justice and we paused because of the Russian incursion into Ukraine. But it seems as though there are not those who want to make peace there or elsewhere in the world. And therefore we have to lift our finger off the pause button and resume the discussions because the development deficit caused by centuries of exploitation is now affecting our capacity to build the resilience that is necessary in our nations. Similarly, I want to thank, because a year ago we did not have the Paris Agenda for People and Planet, we had the Bridgetown Initiative, and the Bridgetown Initiative has allowed us to keep the debate going because we need to change, as I said Monday morning in this hall, the belief that we can have short-term money financing development and building resilience. I shan't go into all of the details because we don't have the time. But suffice it to say that we are committed to the twin battle of saving people and planet. And to ask us to do anything else is a false construct that does not work. The markets have to be educated as to why long-term capital is the only salvation for developing countries and ultimately for people and planet. And my friends, year after year we talk about the need for global moral strategic leadership. I shan't go into all of the details, but in my own region, in Africa, in Latin America, in the Pacific, there are too many examples where we fall short. And I speak specifically now first and foremost about Haiti. The world owes Haiti a resolution. Not, it is not a matter of options. The world owes Haiti a resolution. A year ago we knew that the gas riots had led to serious instability. And 12 months later, we cannot get out of this building and into the support that the people of Haiti need. There is no doubt a need for a legitimacy with respect to the government of Haiti. And therefore, a national unity government may well be the only bridge that can carry us to safety. The Caribbean community has appointed three former prime ministers as an eminent persons group. And as we heard the Secretary General say in this hall, politics is the art of compromise. Diplomacy is the art of compromise. I say simply to those who act in the name of the people of Haiti, there must be compromise in constituting that government of national unity if we are to provide the bridge, to provide the security, to stop women from being raped, stop people from being killed, stop people from being affected by cholera and other public health diseases. But even when we put in the institutional support that Haiti may need, and I want to thank the governments of Kenya and Rwanda, who from as far back as 12 months ago committed to being able to provide the kind of institutional support and leadership that the Haitian police need. But as they did that commitment, what they have not necessarily accounted for is the continued reduction in the numbers of the police largely because of persons fleeing to lands of greater opportunity and being facilitated in so doing. This cannot wait much longer. And I hope that those who constitute the members of the Security Council will recognize that they cannot use Haiti as a pawn because they have suffered for too long and by the hands of too many. I return now to the issue of Cuba. That Cuba can <laughs> help so many in this world and yet be the continued victim of a blockade of over 60 years but worse than that a designation as a state sponsor of terrorism is wrong 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 we left Cuba last week and what the people of Cuba are being asked to face on a daily basis because of a designation by a dying presidency is wrong. And the voices of the global community, many of whom have been the beneficiaries of Cuban assistance, need to stand united 
and to be able to say that we cannot fight these battles when we need all hands on deck to save the planet. The artificial division of who is right and who is wrong and who is good and who is bad in the eyes of those who are powerful cannot continue to be the way in which this world functions. And let us go to Venezuela. Oil is likely, oil prices, to go over $100. And those small countries who do not produce oil will be the victims of it, as will be our people, including in large countries like the United States of America. We must, we must bring resolution to these issues. And it is not incapable of resolution when the United States of America and many countries in Europe determined that they were recognizing President Guaido without there being a presidency for him to assume because he faced no election, the members of the Caribbean community came to this August institution and met with the Secretary General and met with a number of countries. And little by little we saw people apply their hearts to wisdom and to recognize that the Charter of the United Nations did not allow for that kind of unconstitutional conferral of presidency on anyone. I say today that there must be transparency. It cannot be that the Caribbean community that needs a mechanism for, pe for, for stabilization in an energy crisis cannot have access to the, 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 the concessionary prices that the government and people of Venezuela are prepared to make available to its neighbors to minimize the suffering. How is it possible for Chevron and the European Union to access the oil and gas of Venezuela, but the people of the Caribbean cannot access it at the 35% discount offered by the people of Venezuela? How is it possible that we should have to carry a cost of an additional 4% of GDP in my own country simply because the rules that allow for one do not allow for the other. There must be transparency and there must be moral strategic leadership if we are to build the team to save the planet and to save and attain the SDGs in today's world. My friends, there are many other things that we can discuss. We support the United Nations accepting the responsibility for tax. Why? Because as quickly as the world has been able to find a mechanism for a global minimum corporate tax is as long as it has not found a mechanism to be able to inflate the financing opportunities available to developing countries. It cannot be. We know how to run fast in one set of circumstances when it suits one set of people, but yet we run very slow when it matters to billions of people and their access to life and livelihood. I do not want to prey on your time anymore, but suffice it to say that we have reached a point where we must give thanks for the progress made, but recommit ourselves. For the mission was never simply to make progress. The mission is to be able to save the planet and to give the people of the world the best opportunity for life that is necessary for them as human beings. I believe that reform is critical at this point. But what I believe doesn't matter. What matters is the action of each and every country in this. And will we always be in a position of flux? No. There is hope because human beings want to survive. But the problem is, is that those whose actions we most need may be so confident in their survival that they do not act early enough for us. And that is why I say, will we trod the road to be able to get to the gates only to find that we are too late and the gates have closed? It will be open for some, but it will be closed for many. Mia Amomotli was born on October 1, 1965, in Barbados. Coming from a family with a strong political background, Mia's journey into the world of politics seems destined from an early age. She pursued her education at the London School of Economics and Political Science and went on to study law at the University of London. Armed with a solid education, Mia returned to Barbados, ready to make a mark in the political arena. Mia Motley's political career has been nothing short of impressive. 
She joined the Barbados Labour Party, BLP, and quickly rose through the ranks. In 1994, she made history by becoming the youngest queen council in Barbados. In 2003, Mia was appointed as the country's first female attorney general and minister of home affairs, breaking down barriers and paving the way for future generations of women in Caribbean politics. Mia Motley's leadership style has been characterized by her commitment to social justice, economic reform, and inclusive governance. She made history once again by becoming the first female prime minister of Barbados. Under her leadership, Barbados has seen significant advancement in areas such as economic recovery, education, and health care. Beyond Barbados, Mia Motley has played a crucial role in regional and international affairs. As the chair of the Caribbean community, she advocates for the interests of Caribbean nations on the global stage, addressing issues such as climate change, economic development, and social justice. Mia Motley's story is one of resilience, determination, and breaking barriers. Her achievements inspire not only women, but all individuals aspiring to make positive changes in their community. As we wrap up our spotlight on Mia Motley, it is evident that her leadership has left an indelible mark on Caribbean politics. We look forward to witnessing her continued impact on the global stage.